Sometimes, real life is stranger than fiction. This is a reality trip with Ben Farmer Jr. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Reality Trip. I am your host, Ben Fama Jr. Thank you for joining me today. I have a great show coming up today. Now, most people know I like talking about revolutionary ideas. I love talking about revolutionary people. And my next guest is truly a revolutionary. Um, well, the reason why I brought him on the show today was I was generally concerned with the, with the election with Donald Trump that most Americans are not prepared to be able to deal with the uncertainty and maybe some of the fear going on in society. And my main concern was when he was elected with all the riots going on, with all the protests going on, that that would actually backfire, that the violence that we see going out there would actually backfire and that we're not really prepared here in America to be able to deal with these situations. And uh, my next guest is a very important factor in understanding nonviolent protests and not just protesting, but strategy and how to deal with situations. And maybe so we can, we can prepare for the next four years in case anything is to happen. Um, Sergio Popo, uh, Popovic is a Serbian political activist. He was the leader of the student movement Otpor that helped topple Serbian dictator Slobodan Milosevic. I always fuck up that name, but Slobodan Milosevic. Um, he started a Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies, which is a canvas. He's the executive director, and he's worked uh, with over 50 countries with the activists promoting the use of nonviolence resistance and achieving political and social goals. Uh, he's the author of a blueprint for revolution, how to use rice pudding, Lego men, and other nonviolent techniques to galvanize communities, overthrow dictators, and simply change the world. Can't ask for anything better. So welcome to the show, Sergio. Sergio, thank you so much for being here today, bud. How are you? Uh, welcome for inviting me, Ben. Pleasure being with you. Uh, and this is a really important time, obviously, in America right now. I know a lot of people have a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear. Um, I think that no one really knows what's going to happen here in the next four years. No one really knows where this country is going, how we're going to deal, whether this guy is going to just uh, pass laws that we don't want or become a dictator himself. Nobody knows. But I figured right now would be a perfect opportunity to talk about some strategies and how we deal with that. But first off, I want to talk a little bit about you and your background and why this is important, because you led a very important movement here that's not only helped your country, but many other countries out there. And so let's go back uh, uh, to the 90s, okay? Uh, what is your mindset back then? How did you get into political activism and in this movement? Uh, well, to to go back to the time machine, uh, first of all, uh, saying that that I'm very happy to participate uh, in your show. Uh, I, I, I've been a student uh, person of the 19 years, and I, I lived a perfectly pampered life of the former Yugoslavia middle class, uh, meaning that I was I was playing in a rock band and uh, I was thinking that I will grow up uh, doing the animal reality shows. I actually studied biology, so that was my passion. And uh, in early 90s, the, the, the bad guy called Slobodan Milosevic that most of your listeners don't know uh, came to power. And that really sparked a wreaking havoc in Balkans. And he was playing on the national card. He was playing on the card of differences. And, you know, throughout the night, uh, what was once a relatively economically prosperous and pretty stable country uh, turned into the wreaking havoc of six different states fighting each other in a stupid nationalist war. And when you are a young person, you have basically two choices. Uh, one is, of course, to flee. And and a lot of the parts of my generation ended up uh, being uh, very successful people in Silicon Valley or in Australia or just washing dishes in Vienna. Uh, but some of us were too stubborn, so we stand back and fight. So. The political activism in Serbia was a necessity. It was dictated by the conditions. And it was dictated by the fact that our normal life, and under normal life, I, I think the economy and also the values and also the music and also the culture uh, was melting down in front of our very eyes. So most of my generation was not uh, aiming to become activists. When I was, when I was that age, I was thinking, thinking that activism is something super boring, reserved for all old ladies who care about the dog's rights. Uh, but then all the cool people stepped in and all the rock bands stepped in and everybody was fighting this, this crazy way of nationalism, which is how I started. Uh, my generation, which is the, the number of the middle-aged people who are already losing their hair, uh, that was born between 1969 and maybe, maybe 1980, uh, really seen their chance to struggle. And we started with student protests in 1982. We continued with students protests in 1996, 97, which is where we protesting for 100 days in the row 
which is the stupid idea I'm going to to elaborate later. Uh, we ended up forming a movement called Otpor or Resistance. And that was the movement that grew really fast from 11 people to 70,000 people, which is uh, uh, in the country of 7 million, it's a lot of, of uh, uh, super engaged people. That movement was instrumental in bringing the democracy in Serbia. In 2000, we, we brought a lot of people to the elections. We protected electoral results. And we ended up with uh, the, the guy whose name was Butcher of Balkans. Uh, 16 years in a row, uh, we are living in a country which is a decent democracy, not a super economic power, a little bit of corruption, but a place I'm growing my two kids now. So when Milosevic was coming into power, were there signs that you guys were starting to see that this was a problem? Was there, was there a lot of denial? What was the mindset of people as you're starting to deal with the struggle? Uh, as in any in any popular story, a lot of people have seen Milosevic as a savior of the Serbian people. And this very idea to build this integrity of the people on the conflict with the others was, was of course, was fueling his engine. Uh, in, in, on the other hand, a lot of urban people, a lot of clever people, uh, you, you would name them liberals if you would be living in the U.S., but we were not considering ourselves uh, labeled by, by any means. Uh, we were seeing this is turning into lunacy, and we grew up with the ideas that the Croatians and and uh, Slovenians, and these are all the parts of the former Yugoslavia, just to 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 for for your your listeners to understand, are our brothers. And here is the guy who says that we need to to take a rifle and go kill a person because he or she is a Croat. And for us, it was a kind of schizophrenic. It was a kind of surprise, and it took us basically a lot. Uh, to figure out. It was not like, you know, Milosevic coming to power and phew, immediately the, the movement is sparked. Uh, we started by trying to prevent this war and then, then we started by protecting the democracy in 96, 97. And we ended up understanding that the only way to, 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 to really fix Serbia is to focus on the vision and on the values and to, to build up the strategy. And the part of the strategy was winning on the elections, which happened in 2000. So it was not a one day process. It was a gradual process. Serbs are very, very strange animals. We never read books. And, and uh, unlike Americans who have a lot of resources on their disposal, and they could read my book or they can read 10 uh, other uh, far better books uh, coming from Gene Sharp, the Serbs uh, are learning like kids, and I'm having a two-year-old, so you know the only way he he learns not to touch the stove, if he get uh, a little bit of of heat. So we were learning by doing, and that's the slowest way uh, to learn about the stuff. But uh, gradually we understood how to build up this strategy and how to make this movement united, and how to build from the middle. Eventually we we won. So what was the what ended up being the tipping point for you guys, or actually what's the tipping point for you? Uh, for me personally, there were like uh, three very important uh, events in this struggle. The first one was understanding that activism can be cool. And that's that's the one thing that, you know, so when you when you are a teenager, you really care about the chicks and playing in the rock band. And I mean, to be honest, uh, my students from Colorado College are no different than that. And because we are teaching a lot of universities in the U.S. and we see this change now, which we're going to elaborate Later, uh, there are a lot of people who are looking at this like they are looking at the fish in the aquarium. And so these are the Serbs. This is happening to somebody else. And, you know, they live across the sea. And this is where dictatorship is possible, blah, blah, blah. And they would be really inspired uh, by, by, your, by your case. Uh, but as well as we did uh, uh, in the case of, of Milosevic, activism was not something that was coming naturally to us. So the first thing was, was looking at the Serbian uh, super band created out of, of the three uh, main rock bands in the former Yugoslavia playing against the war on the truck. And of course, the concert was banned and I ended up uh, running behind the truck and, and the rock culture was very strong at the point. And this is where I turn around myself and I've seen all the people I love, all the people I appreciate, all the people at that point whom I consider my idols because I was 19 and I wanted badly to be on that truck and playing that anti-war song. Uh, the second very important moment was 96, 97. Uh, we were in our mid twenties. We were, uh, Milosevic has lost and then stolen the local elections. And we protested for 100 days and by, 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 by constant protest and also by, by, by shifting out the international community, we persuaded him to recognize the electoral results. That's a very important point in every movement to look at the tangible victory 
one thing you can win and one thing that we'll use as a rallying point to show to the people that resistance, unlike in Star Trek, is not futile. Resistance is something that pays off. Uh, the last part was was understanding, uh, and and uh, you will of course excuse me for quoting Tolkien very much, but I grew up uh, understanding Lord of the Rings as my Bible, and if you look at the Hobbits, and this is something I quote in in the Blueprint for Evolution very often, uh, uh, when you look at the Hobbits, they are not the most suitable people to win the evil in the Middle East. Earth, they are not tall, they are not strong, they are not wearing shiny armor. Uh, uh, in contrast, they are the people like you and me, uh, uh, loving. Uh, the countryside, uh, very short, very hairy, very lazy, sometimes loving good food, good drink and smoking pot. Uh, these people are not considered to be the, the best suitable people to fight against evil. But like in the role Lord of the Rings, there was nobody else to do the job. This revelation that if we don't do it, nobody else is going to end up with Milosevic. 998, when Otpor was formed, everybody was failing miserably. The opposition was failing miserably for years. International community tried like everything. They tried sanctions. They tried to bomb my country. All of these stupid things that didn't really help. He, the guy was sitting in power. So this is where we figure out that the only way to win is to take the destiny in our own hands. And even if we have a hairy legs and we are not designed to do this thing, this thing, it is our role to do it. Very similarly, when you look across the world, and this is where I spent the last 16 years of my life, uh, working with groups opposing dictators across the world, you are not going to see the members of the political elites launching these movements. You will see political nobodies. You will see the grannies from your neighborhood. You will see the students from your campus. And a lot of these struggles are actually uh, started and run and won by hobbits. This is why I love nonviolent struggles so much, because it's the best vehicle for common people like you and me, 99% of the people, uh, to really perform social change. So so, so uh, don't worry if you are not uh, considering yourself a political person. Don't worry if you are not super educated in how to run the movements. These are the skills. Skills can be learned. And there are so many hobbits around the world fighting uh, uh, against autocracy and fighting against the bigotry and fighting for human rights as we speak. And that's the main, that's the main focus of even why I'm, I'm talking about this, because a lot of people feel especially here in America, like out of control. They're like, well, what can I do? I mean, what can I do? And, and I think it does start from the grassroots movement. It comes from the people and, and the ideas are going to come from there. I think with the gridlock happening in Washington and the politicians, there's just the one thing I saw when I was watching uh, your doc, I watched your document, uh, the documentary, bringing down a dictator many years ago during the Arab spring movement, you know, and I thought, Hey, you know, uh, these are great ideas. And the, and to the think that they're coming home to roost here in America People feel the same way. They can't trust the government. There's political gridlock. They don't know who to turn to, who to trust. And I, you know, I always try to say it's about us. It's about us as the people organizing, using strategies. So when you started this movement, when you were first getting into do this, how did you gain the momentum to get people to actually listen to what you were doing? Because obviously, a lot of times, a lot of us talk. We try to get people motivated. A lot of people feel helpless. How did you cut through a lot of that? Uh, first of all, the, the movie you mentioned, The Bring Down Dictator, uh, which is the great piece of work, can be seen for free in Vimeo. So one of the things that your readers or listeners should do, should go and watch this movement. Uh, this, this is the, the great question. I think the, the first thing is the revelation that, that there is nobody else to do it outside of you. And then throughout the years, uh, we really developed a kind of the way to, to look at it. First of all, we understood that uh, you always start as a minority from one side of the political spectrum. And that doesn't necessarily mean the left or right. That means that you want change and there is a status quo and there are a lot of people supporting change. There are a lot of people supporting status quo, but the most important people are the people in the middle. And the, the only way to win in the nonviolent struggle, which relates a lot to the numbers of the people, is to build from the middle. So we, we unlike 992, 96, 97, we were launching this anti-Milosevic movement, anti-election fraud movement. We start thinking, okay, uh, how do we envision this country? And uh, my organization, Canvas, have been doing workshops with people from 46 different countries. And every time it's always the same. You meet a bunch of the people who are enthusiastic. They've heard of your struggle. They say, oh, you Serbs, you did it greatly. But how the heck we are going to do it, which is why the first chapter of my book is named, It Will Never Happen Here. Because people just don't believe. 
So you start by explaining to them that the first thing they need to do, they need to erase all of this fear, they need to erase all this problem. They need to envision themselves as a Harry Potter or Hermione Granger, to be politically correct, and say, uh, what I would do if I am the king or the queen for the day, how my country would be different, how my community would be different. So dare to hope, dare to think, dare to vision. And then you start with this vision and then you outline the spectrum of allies. Now, who are the people or the constituencies you may want to talk to? Who are the people needed to gain numbers in order for this vision to become reality? Now, what is really interesting in, 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 these, in these last month for me is a the the blueprint book uh, have uh, sales have skyrocketed, and I did a thing that authors really did. I, I left my real email at, at the end of the book, so I'm getting a, a stray of emails from from different people from all across the United States. The same phenomenon happened after Brexit, and and I mean it's like it's when you look at the UK and America as a, as a long established democracies. This is where you don't expect your sales to grow. This is where you don't expect people address you. Uh, normally, uh, it is the stray of the mails from people from Zimbabwe uh, who are coming uh, who are coming into my inbox, and I and I spent last fifteen years working with people from a, from a very oppressive countries. So, what is really really uh, catching your question is that people are kind of feeling lost, they're feeling afraid, and they need. But but whether you are playing the game in autocracy or you are playing the game in established democracy, the rules are all the same. You need vision, you need to know the battlefield, you need to outline your spectrum of allies, you need to build around the values. Uh, the big shock for me when I'm looking at the Brexit, when I'm looking at the, at the US nowadays, is that the very clever liberal urban people, the people I would normally hang out sharing values and having beers with, uh, are, are, are all kind of afraid and they're all kind of lost and they're, they're feeling disoriented. This is normal. And, and this is how the things start. Uh, what, what the people in every movement across the world need to, need to find is need to stick to the values. The reason why Serbian struggle was, was so effective was not because of our great strategy, was not that we were able to bring 2 million people to vote against Milosevic. It was not because we were super witty or super brave. 2.5 thousand people from my movement have been arrested in small countries. So it's a, it's a lot of arrests. Uh, it's because we were looking at the values. We were looking at the future. As opposed to looking at the problem, we we're looking at the solution. We say, we want to live in a country where we have a peace with neighbors. We wanted to live in a country which is the member of the European Union. We want to live in a country where the freedoms are respected. So it was the idea of the freedoms and EU values and the idea of the peace with the neighbors that was holding on throughout the struggle. It was not about Milosevic. Milosevic was a necessary obstacle to be removed in order to win our vision. Uh, successful struggles are never anti-struggles. Successful struggles are always struggle for values. I spent two and a half hours uh, discussing this with people from Occupy Movement. Uh, it's amazing. It was in uh, November 2011. I met a bunch of the people from Occupy at NYU. We regularly teach a course at NYU. The friend of mine say, oh, there is this great group. They're gaining traction. They're you know, sharing your values. I'm, I'm a kind of, of, of moderate lefty myself. I said, okay, this is great. I want to move these people. It took me two and a half hours to figure out what they want. I was getting the answers like, we don't want greedy banks. We don't want this. We don't want that. We don't want blah, 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 blah. Uh, at the end of the day, I was like, okay, but if you would be a king for a day and there is a magic wand and you touch the banks and they disappear, what's there? And it's always offering the alternative and clear strategy, which differences successful movement from a failed movement. And I think this is what lacks in this and world world struggle against the kind of the of the populism. And I've, I've noticed this in Brexit. I, I spent some time in London after Brexit talking to the people who were obviously pro pro European. And and uh, I think the main problem was that they were all playing on fear. So the anti Brexit campaign was trying to make people afraid. If Brexit happens, this is going to be the end of the world. The Brexit campaign say if we stay in the European Union, then all of this uh, crazy immigrants will come in and, you know, eat us alive and take our jobs and rape our wives. And it was fear against the fear. And when the fear plays in, there is nothing good in the society. And when you look at the history of America, it was the hope on which the positive movement of your country have been built. Every time the fear was dominating your politics or Serbian politics, it was the bad news. Which is what's unique about this time in history now, because you're right, th- this whole political campaign 
was all about fear. It was, oh, fear of Donald Trump, fear of Donald Trump, fear of Hillary Clinton. It was, I didn't hear exactly what you said, the values of where do we go from here? How do we actually solve real problems? Because at the end of the day, no one really cares about emails or who grabbed whose you know, genitals or whatever else. People care about, I have problems going on in my life. I need to take care of my family. I got bills I got to pay. I got worry about doctors. I don't hear these values happening in this country anymore. And, and, and you know, America is all about celebrity and it's turned more into like a, a reality show of fear than it has to actually gaining any, any real uh, momentum in value and education, which is what my concern is too. So when you guys were out there and you're, and you're doing this movement and you're, and you're getting people to be engaged and to being a part of this, obviously there had to have been a lot of uh, resistance from from the government, from other type of people. Can you talk about that and how you dealt with that type of resistance? Absolutely. And I think the, the very important thing you noted is the fear and values. And I think that every successful movement needs to sit down and decide what are the values you're sticking to. And, and one of the reasons I love, I mean, I love, I love America. I travel to America five, six times a year. And, and I consider it my, my second homeland in so many different ways. And, and this is because of the values. And you have these values in a great society. And I think uh, whoever wants to launch a positive movement in America should build around these values. And whether these values are the economic freedom, the freedom of movement, uh, the tolerance, uh, these values have been won through the hard work. And, and so many people have been risking their lives by involving in nonviolent struggle or the violent struggle against the British colonial power because you had a vision of the future. So many people have, have broken down with the, with the craziest practices of oppressing black, black people. Uh, it was not when the Martin Luther King united all the black people around the idea of the social equality. It was when the white people start coming in. Because like in any case, the numbers are never on the fringes. The numbers are in the middle. And amazing movie that your, your listeners should, should watch for free on Vimeo. Another great work of a, of a guy called, called Steve York is, of course, a, a force more powerful. And there are six episodes from Gandhi to dance to, to Polish, uh, Polish solidarity. But the piece I'm, I'm, I'm always playing to my students in universities across the U.S. is the piece about the civil resistance, civil rights movement in the U.S. And there is this amazing man that I was so honored to meet uh, whose name is Jim, Jim Lawson. Jim Lawson was a community organizer and trainer for a Martin Luther King campaign in Nashville. And there is this amazing scene in a movie where, where uh, uh, the black activists are sitting in the church. The churches were used for, for this mobilizing. And they are preparing for a great tactic of occupying the, the desk lounge counters or the food courts, how they are known nowadays, in the malls that were segregating. So the black people could buy there, but they couldn't eat in, in the food courts. And he speaks to the bunch of students. And there is a sentence which outlines all the principles of success in nonviolent struggle. And he says, this is what we are going to do. We are going to march to the desk lunch counters in our best Sunday outfit because we want to beat these prejudice that the black people are dirty and homeless and blah, blah, blah. And I want to see the white person walking next to the black person because we want to show that this struggle is not about the black people. It's about the equality for all in America. But I don't want to see the white woman walking next to the black man. We are not ready for this yet. And when you highlight this yet, you can understand the main lesson of Saul Alinsky and his great book, Rules for Radicals. There are things which you need in nonviolent struggle. First of all, the fear and hate are the very powerful, powerful thing for moving people. But, you know, anger without the hope is a destructive force per se. And you need to build a strategy based on the small Victory. So, so speaking about these these uh, situations nowadays, I think what these movements need to figure out are what are the basic values we want to protect or we want to build up upon. How do we build between us and the common people? So it's not us and them. Uh, I I hate to see America this politically polarized. I think if I would be a, a political spin doctor, uh, my campaign would be make America united again. And I know that, that uh, you know, my students from Colorado College would say, oh, Trump is not my president. But sorry, guys, uh, uh, this is democracy. And, and uh, I've seen people being arrested for, dem for democracy. Uh, I've been arrested for fighting for free and fair elections. I've seen people in Ukraine dying for free and fair 
elections. Uh, democracy means that you respect result if you don't like the result. The Serbian president is the last person in the world that I will be voting for, but he's the president of my country. So this is to the people on the left. To the people on the right, there is also this idea that, you know, it's like I'm, I'm seeing all of this, all of these things coming out that the climate change is a hoax. It's rubbish. Climate change is not a hoax. It's a thing that it's that is going to harm you. It's going to kill your kids in ten or ten or fifteen years. And you know there is this this crazy idea of you know friendly dictators and illiberal democracies. There are all these stupid experiments all across the Europe. You want to look at the Hungary. You want to look at the Poland. You want to look at the Turkey. This is where you have elections, but you don't have democracy. So when you look at the fringes of this conflict, uh, the real numbers, the people you really want to mobilize are in the middle. So building around the values and building the vision around the values and thinking about the hope and thinking how to make this country great again. This is what helps Serbian movement. This is going to help the people all across the world, wherever they want to launch the movement. What do you think are the biggest challenges in doing that too, when it comes to like one of the concerns that a lot of us as Americans have is, or even if we just study history is losing a lot of those democratic rights that we have, freedom of speech. You know, I, I'm sure I, th these things happened in your country. They happen in other countries. What are some things that we can prepare for in the end to use nonviolent struggle against things that could, we can't predict the future, but I always try to say you learn a lot from human history in the past. So even though I don't know what Trump is going to do with, you know, the first amendment rights or how far he's going to take what he wants to do with the world, what are some things that you would do now knowing what you know, know with America? Uh, well, uh, first of all, we, we never tell people what to do. Uh, our workshops and our courses are about giving people tools to figure out what they want to do. And uh, the reason for that is that the foreigner will never know. How, however, I spend much time in America. It is the Americans who need uh, to figure it out. Uh, uh, what, what I see now and, and from a professional point of view is that there are plenty of the resources there uh, to build from. Uh, there, are, there are democratic elections. There are pretty open, free and fair media. Uh, there is a freedom of assembly. There are so many people, things people can do uh, to to protect whatever values they want to protect. But uh, uh, there is this. There is a great quote from a from a professor from Fletcher, and and I don't know his name. I can't remember it. It's it's ten thirty p.m. in Serbia, and he says that every democracy uh, democracy is like love. You need to make it every day. So having a strong institutions is only one part of the puzzle. Having active citizens, making their politicians accountable for whatever they are doing, for whatever decisions they are doing, this is the second part of the puzzle. Institutions can be easily uh, misused by the politicians. We are seeing this every every single day across the world. And and I mean, it's the endless list of the of the countries which have elections, but then the p people come in power and they rule it like like uh, like they are the only person in the show. That makes unhappy society. Take a look at the Turkey. Take a look at the Venezuela. Uh, it is the people's role uh, to defend their democratic institutions. It is the people's role to defend their basic freedoms. It is the people's role to defend the basic values in the society. This will never stop. And I think the real problem is that a lot of people in established democracies uh, uh, got lazy or spoiled. And, and I'm an evil Serb, so, uh, so I'm not using a super politically correct uh, vocabulary. But they somehow consider these things for granted. These things are not for granted. The government institutions are good for as long as you can keep them accountable. But it's a two-way road. It's a two-way street. It's not like, uh, like uh, you can go asleep and say, oh, we have this perfect democracy over here. You never know what the politicians will do. I mean, corruption is not something which is happening in the Balkans. Corruption is something which is happening everywhere. Every single power holder have the possibility to misuse the power. It is the role of the people to activate the institutions to prevent them from coming down. And there will be resistance. Uh, there, there, will be, there will be resistance from, from the people on the other side of the political spectrum. There will be resistance from the people in the middle. People don't like to be awake from their, from their winter sleep. But uh, uh, in order to have a stable democracy, and this is absolutely unrelated to the election results, you need to be uh, to look at the people being active always. Uh, one great example I'm always I'm always looking at, and that's that's one of my of my political or social passions as well, is the environment. And and uh, I'm living in the country which is in the environmental stone age. 
you know what Stone Age means? That means that we still have citizens that are throwing their unseparated garbage through the windows straight on the street. Yes? Okay, great. I hate that. And, and uh, it is a, such an uphill struggle. You need to mobilize people in your neighborhood. You, you need to make this uh, socially unacceptable. You need to bring laws. You need to, to make all of these beautiful containers to separate the garbage. And when you look at this struggle, this is where the institutions are part of the solutions, not part of the problem. But it is the people who need to change the habits, the people who need to launch this. This will never work if you only put the containers there and do nothing about that. And the containers itself is not going to solve the problem. and They're not going to make me separate garbage in my home. And I'm, I'm intentionally picking a politically completely neutral thing. It doesn't really apply whether you're a liberal or you're right wing or whatever conservative. It's something that that is it is it is for common good. Uh, uh, building around your values and bringing people from the middle, explaining to them that this is for their common goods. Building your values around the fact that uh, you're not want to build from differences; you want to build from commonalities. Because I assume that a bunch of garbage is not the good news, whether you're voting a Republican or Democratic, and and this is how this thing happened. And when you look at the history of the environmental movement, which is actually the most vivid part in the last several years in the U.S., at least in my experience, you'll find it started by a small group of hobbits. And the hobbits were crazy in the beginning. And they were tying themselves for the fences of the nuclear power plants. And they were considered the outcasts, the hippies, the, the, I mean, whatever. And they were this tiny minority. It was when they figured out to find their voice to persuade the people that it is in your common interest to stick to these values, that they were launching the movement that was persuading the government, the local governments first, and then the federal government, they didn't need to do this. There are so many great victories of environmental movement in the past that brought us to where we are. There are so many interests in, in, in LGBT movement in the past. And, and you know, who, whoever wants to look at a blueprint for building the movement of oppressed people should go and, and download the Hollywood blockbuster called Milk, about the Harvey Milk, the first elected LGBT person. And you can see all the mistakes down the road. It's amazing. It started by, you know, understanding, oh, we gay people are oppressed. You know, nobody wants to deal with us. We are whistling, blowing, and blah, 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 blah. And, of course, we are all going to live in Castro Street in San Francisco. And then, of course, he moved a step forward. He says, I'm going to run for the office. I'm going to change this. And he gets into the mainstream politics. He says, I'm, I'm going to make all the gay people vote for me. He, he lost miserably. He ended up nine. And then in the second step, he says, I'm going to unite all of this liberal parts of San Francisco to vote for me. So on the spectrum of allies, he was going from here, which is very narrow group of LGBT people, to there, which is a little wider, low-hanging fruit of liberal people. Of course, that was not enough for him to be elected. And then he completely changed the focus of his struggle. He started listening instead of preaching. And this is what the effective movement leader should do. You should go and listen to the people, why they are at the point where they are considering your vision. And this is the very important part of my book. Uh, and, and of course, I got, got a lot, lot of angry emails uh, from the people. So I said the, 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 the biggest victory of Harvey Mill was understanding that it's not about the gay rights. It was about the dog's poop. This is where he figured out, he goes on the street, he understands the majority of the people of San Francisco care more about the dog's poop than they care about the LGBT rights. And he shifted the focus of his struggle. He says, whether gay or straight, I'm the guy who is going to solve your problems. What happens? He got selected. The rest is history. Uh, we are now having LGBT people in government everywhere, in US, everywhere, across the world. So that was the breaking point, trying to listen to the people, looking at what is important for them, accommodating your, your, your campaign, your message to this. And this is exactly uh, what happened with LGBT movement. This is exactly what happened with the climate change movement. This is happening with, with legalizing uh, recreational drugs movement all across the U.S., where they started from a bunch of criminals and drug abusers. And now we're looking at Colorado with its 26 million year of the federal thing. And, 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 and coming to Colorado a lot, this is my, my favorite American state, uh, you, if you've ever been there, you, you would know this is not uh, a Seattle, this is not the California, this is not the most liberal part of the U.S., this is America and small. But it happened because it influences the life of the people, it reduces the drug crimes, it brings money into the budget, 
And there are so many positive things there. And playing on the positive, playing on the hope is how this movement really won. There are so many examples all across the U.S. that if you put your finger on, you don't need to call in the crazy Serbs to participate in your podcast. Yeah. And, you know, and that's that's the whole point of what I'm getting at. You know, I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago about especially about nonviolent protesting. And he said he's this guy used to be a political activist himself, and he feels like there has to be violent protesting. I said, look, there's just as much strategy and effectiveness in nonviolence, and it takes the same mindset and it's and it has more effect and effectiveness and be able to do that. So one of the questions I have is let's say, for example, you're successful in this revolution, all right, whatever it is you're trying to do, I tend to find that there's a lot of times that people end up making a lot of mistakes. And what I mean by that is I tend to find that a lot of times when I see revolutions that happen throughout time, they become just as bad as the people they're trying to overthrow in the first place. It's, it's like Animal Farm, you know, from George Orwell. You know, you have one group of animals, they overthrow, you know, the person, and then they become the bad people. What do you and think? And then at the end, the pigs are worse than the man. Exactly. So, so even if you're to be a revolutionary and you're going to use nonviolent strategies, what do you think of the mistakes that people make when they get into this process? And why do you think they end up being right back at square one with these new people? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, first of all, uh, first of all, uh, let's let's uh, go back to the violence idea. Uh, the violence struggle uh, 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 are are this is not the. Uh, the ethical me, and I'm not a person who was fighting a lot in the school. Obviously, you can see how built I am. I'm, I'm not really looking as a quarterback. So the the physical strength was never my 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 thing. Uh, there, aside of being more ethical, the nonviolent struggle is far more likely to succeed. And there is a great uh, there is a great study run by two American scholars, Maria Stepan and Erika Chenovet, called "Why Civil Resistance Work." And this is the biggest scientific study of violence and nonviolence. And they have scientifically proved uh, that uh, in the last 100 years, with over 300 campaigns in the study, you have twice more chances to win if you use nonviolent struggle, 53% of the chances as opposed to 26. Uh, the reasons are many. Uh, first of all, when you're using the violence, especially if you're using the violence against the state, uh, you're trying to box against Mike Tyson. It is the state that has a monopoly on violence. You, you can't really win. This is ridiculous. You want to fight Assad, the most stupid thing is to pick up the firearms from 80s because it's the fourth biggest military power in the Middle East. So the moment you switch from nonviolence to violence, you're changing the battlefield into a battlefield which comforts your opponent, not yourself. But the second reason is, of course, that the nonviolence work when the numbers are big. And when you look at your phone book and you start thinking, okay, I want to run this guerrilla movement and throw stones and throw molotovs, how many people I know that are ready to do that. As opposed to that, you start thinking, okay, how many people I know who would hit the pots and pans until this, whatever, the pick for environmental protection agencies changed because he's a climate change denier. I, I, I've seen this in the news today. I'm, I'm, I'm just sucking this from my little finger. Everybody, the grannies can do it, the kids can do it. So it's like when you look at the numbers of the people you can mobilize in your struggle, you're talking nonviolent struggle, uh, then, then you're looking at a far broader spectrum, and these struggles, of course, are are far more likely to participate. Not too many people will will participate in risky tactics. That's another very important message for those who are organizing anything anywhere in the world. Uh, the reason why 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 I was why I was sure that Occupy will be failed, they were sticking the most demanding, uh, most exhausting, and most divisive tactics in the world. Uh, you sit and occupy symbolic public place. Amazingly, bank that you want to hurt, which works op operating her business hours uh, across the street as usual, how do they care about you sitting in the park? What about persuading the 10,000 people in that bank withdraw the account? This is where these tactics of non-cooperation are so powerful. What about putting a brick in your business reply mail and sending it to the bank with a cost of 70 bucks? If thousands of us do that, we are just hurting the bank with $70,000. And we don't even need to sit in the park. We, we don't even need, I, I mean, I can wash my, my kid's ass and pack the brink and send it to the bank. So you want to spread the idea of the tactics. You want your risk bar, your investment bar for tactic as low as possible. And this is what rises the participation. Uh, why the movements fail? They, they fail because they, they fail the three main principles, unity, planning, and nonviolent discipline. A unity uh, you need black people and white people. You need LGBT people and 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 straight people if you want to win because the numbers are never 
on the fringe. You need people who, who, who really care about the environment and people who don't know or don't give shit about the environment to win the environmental uh, battle. You, you need people who, who really understand and care for the rights of the immigrants. And you need people who don't know immigrants or are afraid of immigrants. Uh, it's unity stupid is, is one of the chapters in the book. And this is as straight as it is. Second is planning. Uh, it's not about let's go out in the street and chant and protest. It is planning what you want to achieve. It is planning your strategy. It is planning your tactics. It is always asking yourself, is there anything else I can put my resources in aside of just getting people marching in the street? The third one is nonviolent discipline. One single idiot that throws stones or Molotov cocktail on the protest rally of 100,000 people. Imagine the situation. Who gets the cover page of tomorrow's New York Times? That guy. He's either the agent provocateur or, you know, he just wants to, to break the car or, you know, he just uh, discovers that his wife is shitting on him, but he's taking all the show. One single act of violence can destroy non-violence movement. We, we have seen thousands of these cases in the past. So it's unity, planning, and nonviolent discipline. These are the main, the main principles of success. And there is also another thing which, which, which I figured out throughout the years. Uh, uh, you know, you can bring 10,000 people on the march and they can uh, walk across the street and they can wear the candles. And, and this is as uh, fun as, as getting to the dentist office. You need to be fun. You need to be cool. You need to use your humor. There's so many people with great sense of humor. And we call this phenomenon the laughtivism. And there are so many examples. We started by, of course, Serbs are, don't try this at home. We are not politically correct. The tactics can be copy-pasted. But we painted the president on a petrol barrel. And we put a hole in the top of the petrol barrel. So you can come in, you put a coin in, and you get a very big baseball bat and hit the president's face. And that, of course, produces a lot of noise. And there is a clue of the people. And we did it in a, in a bright day in a, in a Serbian, uh, a lousy version of the Fifth Avenue where all the downtown shoppers with their kids were. So there was like 200 people waiting for their chance to put the pinball, uh, uh, the pinball uh, a penny and get their right to express their love for their president. But that was not the funny part. The funny part was when police arrived. What the heck they're going to do? Arrest downtown shoppers, bring them to the police station, charge them with what? It would be out in 30 seconds. Find us, the evil minds who were behind this insult for the presidents, who were nowhere to be seen. We were uh, two corners away having espressos in, in Nearbuck's coffee shop and having fun. Of course, they did the most stupid thing. They arrested the bar. So uh, putting your opponent in a funny action between the rock and the hard place. There's so many great love activists in the U.S. Some of them are my idols. You, you know about the yes man. Yes men are this crazy group of the, of the uh, uh, anti-corporate activists. And I'm so proud and so happy to know Andy Bilbaum. And what they did over the Occupy, while everybody else was angrily uh, uh, yelling in the park, uh, they made a show. They, they were running the lab on the NYU, which is called the Yes Lab. And they came out with this great dilemma action. They, they, they bore the costumes from a nearby theater and they make a corrida. There was a guy dressed as a matador. And he came out, the iconic bull from the Wall Street. You can find all of this on the YouTube, has 300,000 views. And there were like two guys who were pretending to be clowns. And while the clowns were getting the attention of the police, the matador symbolically came in and struck the evil bull of the Wall Street. It probably cost $7. The people were arrested, or kind of detained. They came out within five minutes. The risk level was low. The reach was fantastic. Uh, I think these people made, made, made their point, made their message against the corporate uh, 1%, far more stronger than the people who were yelling angrily in the park. So look at the creativity, look at the humor. There is a lot of this across the United States. And, you know, make America funny again. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, here's the other thing, too. I mean, just to be realistic, we're talking about the United States military police officers. We have the most powerful army in the world. I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah, we all talk about being able to carry guns. Your gun ain't going to do nothing to the United States military. So it's almost like you have to use these tactics. You have to use nonviolent strategies. You're going to have to go out there and use even a little bit of comedy. Because, you know, I think comedy is a great way to cut through fear. You know, when you, when, you can, when you can kind of laugh about it, it gives you the ability to take that power back and to do that. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. So um, 
you know, uh, it, amazingly, amazingly, it's, uh, the po- the real power of humor is a it it kills fear and it's natural when you're preparing for a for a surgery. The last thing you want to hear is how the surgery is going to go, and and unlike that, if your friend cracks a joke, the fear melts away. Second, a very important reason: the humor attracts people. If you are start thinking in your in your normal conscious life, who is the most attractive person uh, in your surrounding? It's never the most clever one, it's never the richest one, is the one who can always make you laugh. So it drugs the people. But it also puts the other side between the rock and the hard place. And this is where the loftivism comes in. Uh, mentioning mentioning your military, I'm, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, I was, I was super proud to learn that, that, uh, that some of the people who were participating in the Standing Rock protests have read my book and actually mailed me. And, and uh, I was looking at the protest and, and I'm, I'm, I have so many ties to, to the environment. I have so many ties of, of I, I used to serve as the environmental uh, advisor to the Serbian prime minister in my young years. I graduated the freshwater biology. I was also, when I was a kid, we were always playing the cowboys and Indians, which, which is how Serbs still call the Native Americans. I always wanted to be an Indian or, or the Native American when I was six. So this was, I, I was looking at this. And you know what was the breaking point was? It was when they pulled the power of the pulling the pillars. It is when the former military veterans stood in defense. That was the straw that broke camel's back, in my opinion. So you don't want us and them. You want to look at there and understand that there are people there. And some of their people are caring for environment. They're caring for their kids. At the end of the day, it was, it was the military that, that provides them with a kind of the, of the small victory they're, they're riding on now. So pulling the pillars, pulling people from these pillars of, of support is something that the cleverest movements uh, uh, have been done. And, and they're doing it in the U.S. like this week. So it's like that. there are so many great examples of creative people. There are so many great examples of successful strategy. And, and what, but, but one problem with activism is when people find themselves in, a, in, a, in a uncharted territory, which is how how majority of the people in U.K., and U.S. are probably feeling, or at least this is the sense. I'm getting haven't been in the in the U.S. since elections. My next trip is to New York in in February to teach at NYU. And uh, uh, you you always start thinking, oh, what I'm going to do? I'm living in this this darkness. There's so many great things that people have done in the past, and some of these things uh, uh, coming from United States of America are the examples we are using. When we are talking in the people like from Venezuela, so it's like the 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 the, the, the examples are there, and and it's amazing how little we we learn from our history. And that and that's my biggest beef of all time is we don't learn shit from history. And I think even as Americans, we've become very we've become very complacent. We've become very much like, oh, this just happens yeah, in other countries. Yeah, we get we talk about all this other dumb shit, reality shows, and and you know whatever's on the Twitter war, but. Very few people have really understood the perils of history and just human behavior and how we act. And, and that's my concern is, is that, you know, we're not any different as a democracy than any other empire that's been out there. We have every ability to lose everything that we have. It's still human beings behind all of this. That's what I try to emphasize with people is that you're not, it's not because you're an American, you have a democracy. It's because psychologically as a human being, you value these things. And the forefathers of our country valued these principles because they dealt with these things. But we're not any more immune than, than the Roman Empire, or the Egyptian Empire, or anything else like that. And so the one thing I always noticed throughout history and time is a lot of people were complacent. They didn't pay attention. They just ignored it. I know a lot of people here in America don't even want to look. They're just like, oh, I'm tired of hearing about the elections. I'm tired of hearing about this. That's what I'm concerned about more is how do you get that message for people to not be afraid, but to really listen and not just tune it out like they do everything here. You know what I'm saying? Like people, like they might be concerned one day. And then the next minute, they'll just totally forget about it. It's like we've already forgotten about what Donald Trump said last year about shit, right? You know, so getting that message out to people and that unifying factor, like you said, I think is what's important. Even for me, like it's not about a left-right thing. I think there's a lot of issues if we sat down and we realized, hey, we can benefit from both sides of the argument here. Getting people to be united, not letting the police officers and the military be our enemies, because like you said... Um, you know, these are people, these are human beings that feed their family and doing everything. Most of these guys don't want to be out there in the cold weather having to deal with protesters, right? They're just doing their job. Why give them a reason to attack you when they don't even want to do it themselves? I mean, uh, look at it from a human standpoint, right? 
using that strategy is going to benefit you and them. And like you said, when the veterans came in for Standing Rock, that's why they said, hey, nobody wants to see innocent people being hurt. No one wants to see an oppressive force. And, and I guarantee most of these police officers out there don't really want to be there either. So understanding that fucking mindset and getting your head out of your ass and, and running around being scared is, is, is what I'm calling bullshit on. And that's why I'm, I'm so glad you came here today to talk about that because it is a real strategy. It's sitting the fuck down and being like, how do we deal with this? What the good thing is, is that we're at the beginning of this, right? Most of the time, you know, you were dealing with this. I know in Egypt and stuff, they were dealing with it when it was already too late. Here we are at the beginning of it. Why not start preparing now? Start, start thinking. Start bringing groups together. Start thinking of the ideas and the, and the ways that we can use strategy. We saw it happen with Standing Rock. We can do it in the next four years and maybe, Olivia, uh, maybe really learn from something. Hopefully. I don't know. You know, as Americans, who knows? Who knows what we value? But to me, that's what I value. I value, like you said, the climate. I value science. I value education. I value people. I value progress. And I feel like America is still a great country. It doesn't need to go through its birthing cycle, I guess, whatever. But getting people to get their head out of their ass long enough to think about what, what it actually takes is, is the hard part. It's, it's, the, it's the most difficult part to do. So, the, the good news about people not learning from their own history is that uh, they're they are going to listen to your show and they're going to buy my book. So uh, for two of us, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a good news. Uh, but seriously speaking, I think there are a lot of people who are who are uh, uh, understanding the values of the society. They're ready to build uh, from the middle. And and for me, as a, as a foreigner, uh, never forget the fact that uh, you guys have a great responsibility. Together with European Union, America is still the the biggest beacon of uh, democracy across the world. World needs uh, a beacon of democracy. We are we are living in a murky times. We are living in a times where democracy backslides. All across the world, where where human rights are are something which is uh, striked in the in the uh, they are either under the economic interest or they are slammed uh, with the propaganda. So, but but speaking sincerely, and and I, I get a lot of crazy calls from people all across the world. This is what I'm doing for a living. I'm I'm, I'm meeting the people who are in trouble and and try to help them how to figure it out. Uh, I'm kind of, of uh, always telling to my American friends, uh, uh, you have a great society, you have a great values, you still have a lot of the of the great institutions to to build from. Uh, I, I believe that that uh, I, I believe in that in that furrow that that uh, making America united again uh, will solve the problem. And I see a lot of energy there, but never forget, democracy is like love, freedom is like love. Uh, tolerance is like love. It's not just the standing institutions, the people fighting for this every day. The fact that there is a law that prohibits you to call somebody a nigger, that doesn't prevent you to do that. It is something you need to feel. It is the value you need to give to your kids. It is how you start. I have a two and a half year old, and he always watches this, you know, cartoons where there are little characters with different color of skin. The first thing you teach your kid is that everybody is born equal. This starts at home. It has nothing to do with the fact that there is a law that will panel me 500 bucks if I insult somebody on the racial basis. This is not where it started. This is where it ends. If, not, if, if my father didn't taught me that, then there is a law that is going to ban me. And like with everything else, it is a grassroots thing and people should build it from the grassroots. Forget and always uh, go and watch The Lord of the Rings. We are all the hobbits and there is nobody else take that drink to Mordor. You need to do it yourself. It has to be you. It starts with you. And that's, that's what I keep trying to say here. So hopefully people understand that, understand you have the power. You don't need to get every single person on board, but there just needs to be enough, the 20%, 30% out there that say, Hey, we have the power. And that's what we forget. We, we tend to think it's these big people up there, but no, it really is us. And it's not cliche. It's not just cause I'm saying, cause it's pretty and it's fucking beautiful words. I'm not into that bullshit. I'm, I'm talking about real shit where it's about you, the way you're thinking, the ideas you're trying to bring across, and be around other like-minded people that get that. You know, don't just be around people that confirm your biases or whatever else. Get around people that understand these values, how we understand the world, how we understand ourselves, and then how we become better people in doing that. Because the only thing that we, we, we benefit from questioning the way society is. We, we benefit by helping each other out. We benefit by having a sense of security and getting rid of a lot of this bullshit fear that we have to go through in our lives. So, um. I'd like to end this real quick with letting people know how they can find out more about you, what you're doing, and what some things you have in the works in the future. 
Uh, well, the, the, the easy way to do it is to visit our website, www.canvasopedia.org. Uh, there, there is a very interesting thing called the cartoon training. Actually, we cut down the ideas. We are talking about the vision and the unity. And this is where you can learn how to effectively protest or build a movement in Arda 30 minutes. And it's animated for those people who hate long speeches. Uh, second, there is this book called The Blueprint for Revolution, which you can buy. And uh, the people like it. And it's a very easygoing way to, to learn about the stuff. And there are a lot of different resources out there. You can watch The Bringing Down the Dictator, the great movie free from by me. Or you can watch, the, you can watch the, the Force More Powerful, which is about the other struggle. You can go and learn about the Gene Sharp. There is the stray of the people who are talking and thinking about the nonviolent movements. And, and I'm the smallest and the last in the line of this uh, people. But first of all, you need to wish, you need to believe and trust in yourself. And you need to understand that uh, there is nobody else to do it aside of you. And once you make this step, everything else is there ready for you to be downloaded from the internet. But there is a hard work. It's very difficult to make the social change. The, the, the people are hard to move. The people are apathetic. Uh, we are living in the age where people, as you said, uh, the, the, the very, in a very beautiful way by not taking the the, the heads up from your ass, the people attention span is short. So, so it's going to be the hard work, but believe to somebody who invested the most beautiful years of my life in doing this in Serbia, who spent uh, the rest 15 years of my life uh, working with people from across uh, the crazy countries, it pays off. Uh, there is nothing like going to bed and understanding that you did something positive for your community, for your neighborhood, for your country. It's a, it's a great feeling. It's not a phrase I was living it. And, and uh, every single, I mean, I, I left politics because of it. I left parliament because of it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still living in a rental apartment because of it. And a lot of the people from my age would consider me crazy. Uh, but there is nothing like satisfaction in understanding that you are either creating the positive social change or you're helping somebody else to create it. It's a, it's a great rewarding work. It's probably how the real artists are feeling when they make a great song. No, absolutely. And for anyone that wants to know uh, all the links and all the stuff that he had said, we're going to have those in the description notes. So if you want to go to my website, benfamajr.com, if you're watching this on YouTube, it'll be on there, iTunes. I'll have all the links and definitely go check it out. It's really, really important, especially in this time and age, especially if you feel like you really want to do something, you're wondering what the hell is going on, turn off CNN, turn off fucking Fox, go out, learn something and, 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 and go out and make a difference. So, Sergio, thanks so much. Thanks for all your hard work and all turn your valuable insights. So, what's that? Turn off each channel. Turn off each channel. Yeah, each channel is the entertainment reality thing. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Just cable. turn off the TV. Period. Just watch. Just watch this shit, and then you'll be <laughs> fine. So, but anyways, thank you so much for all your insight and all your valuable hard work, and I, re I really appreciate it. Pleasure, all mine. That's our show for today. I'm real. This is Reality Chip. Uh, you can check out more of our content at BenFamaJr.com. See you later. You've been listening to Reality Trip with Ben Farmer Jr. Check out more great content by visiting benfarmerjr.com.